it's uh, time to worship with her offering. We're not going to be passing any uh, baskets or anything. There is a uh, basket uh, outside the back of the church right here. If you want to give an offering, we're just going to pray for it at this time. I'm in Luke uh, chapter 17, verse 20, and it says this. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. But behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's here. It's now. It's for believers who have been dwelling Holy Spirit. It's for those who are born again, committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in his kingdom. We're aliens passing through. We're sojourners. This isn't our home. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you and praise you so much, Lord God, for the, the blessings of, of countless things. I can't begin to show the gratitude in, in, in any uh, simple way other than just thank you for it all. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for the love, for the grace, for the mercy, Lord God. Thank you for the, for the rough, tough times, Lord God, as some of us are going through struggles, and we know, Lord God, that through those struggles, we will immerse on the other side, uh, closer to you and, and knowing more than we did before, Lord God. So for those who are going through hardships, Lord God, we pray that they, they feel your presence and that they know that you are there in the storm with them, Lord God. We ask that you bless this, uh, this offering, Lord God. We just lift it up to you for your glory. In your precious son, Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to have the kids head to the back, along with the teachers. If you have your Bibles, we are going to be in Galatians chapter 3. It's interesting how um, sovereign God is in the sense of how He plans things out. and um, It's nice when you get a glimpse of some of that. Occasionally, we're living in uh, crazy times, for sure. And um, as we think about that, the here we are in the Book of Galatians. You know, the Book of Galatians is uh, all about the gospel. It's about living, you know, the good news in the power of the Spirit. And we're going to see some of that. But as I was thinking this week, there were s several things that came in sharp focus for me, at least personally. I'll explain to you. But before I do that. You know, one of the things about the gospel is, you know, we're singing, and, we're, and we'll see it today, we've been, we sing about the cross, we, we, th we sing about the importance of, of staying focused on the main things. So, on that note, I like a little participation sometimes, um, we think about the gospel of Jesus Christ as being this message of his death on a cross for our sins, and his resurrection from the dead for our justification, for our salvation. So certainly, if Jesus was still dead in the tomb and a rotten uh, corpse, that would do nothing for us, right? We know that from 1 Corinthians 15, that if Jesus is not risen, then we really are the most worthless, pitied people in all the world. Because we come in here and we sing to a dead God, right? That would be completely worthless and a waste of time. And um, But we know that's not the case uh, for a lot of reasons. But when we think about the gospel as being... The, the thing that unites us, the thing that brings us together, um, what are some, if we call that essential, what are some non-essential things that, are, that we believe? Help me out. Money? money? Well, I'm talking about more theological things. Oh, okay. But money is, I mean, there's certainly theology of money for sure. Yeah, pre-trib person, you believe the rapture's pre-trib. If you don't believe the rapture's pre-trib, are you a heretic? I would hope not. Okay. Young earth, if you believe the earth is billions of years old, are you a heretic? No. Okay. No. Okay. What else? Feminism. What is it? Feminism. Feminism. Okay, that's good. We have, what about keeping the law? 
Right? We've been talking about that. You believe you should keep the law, the Old Testament law. You want to keep kosher. You don't want to eat bacon, egg, shrimp, crab. You know, those kind of things. If you, if you, if you eat crab or bacon, are you a heretic? See, we have this understanding of these secondary or what they call tertiary, these third level doctrines, right? And we recognize that um, we're going to have disagreements on those things. What you didn't mention was, what about wearing a mask? Are you a heretic? Are you, I'm serious. Are you, are, you, um, are you, by definition, an unloving Christian? It's interesting to me that what I'm seeing in the culture, and, I, and, we, and we need to address this, it comes along with what we're talking about, in that... I, you know, I get emails from buddies and friends and pastors and what you're seeing now is the way that the world is becoming a little bit successful at dividing us. Non-Christians are telling us what loving your neighbor as yourself means. They don't even believe the Bible, but they're going to come tell us if you truly loved, you would do this. And we go... Now again, what I'm seeing is that some people are telling their pastors, if you don't require masks, I'm leaving the church. I'm dividing. Others will say, if you don't require a mask, or either way, right? If you do require a mask, I'm leaving. If you don't require a mask, I'm leaving the church. So then the pastors are in the middle going, somebody's leaving, right? Because you, you, can't, you can't win. When you have these, these two opposing viewpoints, and what we see in Scripture is the, the, the nature of these secondary or third issues. I'm not, I'm not denying that those aren't, any of those things aren't important. But when people make a stand of, let's say, the pre-trib position, or the old earth position, or the young earth position, or whatever, they certainly are convinced, Right? And that's fine, you know. But the Bible, especially in Romans 14, gives this latitude. It gives freedom for people believing different things in those other issues. Now, if you come or I come and I say, Jesus is not the way to salvation, there's a different gospel, fire me, right? Throw me out, I'm a heretic. But what you have is, this is super important in that we cannot let the world define for us Theology. We cannot. We, Romans 12, 2 says we are not to be conformed to the world. Now, what we, what we should say is, hey, and for us, we're trying our best. That's why over there, I really mean it. Do not walk in there without a mask. Okay? No exceptions between 10, 30, and 12. Because we're trying to be respectful of those that feel but led to wear a mask and they fit strongly about that. And we go, yes, absolutely. We want to make that available. Okay. We're not doing that in here, but it is, there is wisdom. I put it on the sign out there. Depends on where you get your wisdom from. Keep your distance, right? You know, we, we're seeing that the CDC is saying six feet is this magic number. And you're a heretic if you're at five foot, 10 inches. But the World Health Organization is recommending to the rest of the world three feet. Which, which, who's, your, you know, who's your master? There is wisdom, and in, in we don't... The last thing we would ever want is to have us be an outbreak because we weren't being wise. But what the, the subtle thing here is when you die and stand before God, is He going to say, why didn't you wear a mask? <laughs> or were you pre-trib? Did you believe in a young earth or an old earth? This is super important because, you know, one of the things that helps us get clarity in these issues is death. Right? I got a phone call on Monday and, uh, from Washington, you know, and I was like, what is this? So usually, if I don't recognize the number, voicemail. Okay? If it's that important, I'll leave a message. And so I got a message and it was from a doctor. Hey, can you call me? Okay. So I called back and, and they said, Oh, we want to let you know that um, you're on this list that your friend, Ken, is here in the hospital and he's really, really sick. And I go, Okay. And 
he, this, this guy, 52 years old, COPD, several things, actually had both of his legs amputated in the last six months at different times. Lots of different things, I mean, infections, and a uh, guy that was attending our church in Washington, and I said, okay, well, I appreciate the phone call. She said, well, that's not the only reason I'm calling. I'm calling because I talked to um, the wife, who the wife left six months ago, and she said that you're in charge of all his end-of-life decisions. <laughs> and I'm like, really? She goes, yeah, and then I called the ex-wife, and she said the same thing. You guys need to call Mondo. So here, she goes, are you willing to do that? She goes, because as a doctor, I have no idea what, how to move forward. She goes, I can tell you this. He is not going home. He will never go home again. 52. This blood infection is shutting down all of his organs, and I need to know how you want to move forward. And I said, well, thankfully, um, I had talked to him just a few weeks ago, and he told, I said, he told me, do not resuscitate me. I want no life support. I'm in God's hands. I'm going to trust that whatever God has for me. And he says, you know what? When I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And, I, and I, it was interesting. I thought, I said, so that's, I'm not telling you what I think he wants. I'm telling you exactly what he wants. We had this conversation. And she said, okay. She goes, well, then we will switch everything over to comfort care. And I was like, okay. And she goes, if, if he comes, if he comes to, you know, they're talking about video chats. I said, I absolutely would love to chat with him. And because uh, we had been texting and I had talked to him a few weeks ago on the phone. But so that was kind of a shock. So then less than 24 hours later, your friend passed away, 52 years old. And I thought, when, you, when you're in that situation, I realized sometimes how stupid we can be in allowing these, I'm not saying that they're, they're unimportant, but they aren't the most important. These things divide us. And, 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 what, and what we see is, I'll say it this way. I don't know whether what we're in, you know, we're certainly in the end times, okay? We understand the way things are going. That, that, I think that's pretty, pretty solid. But we don't know how, especially as American Christians, how serious it's going to get. What we do know is that there's a shift that's taking place in the sense, especially in this very aggressive uh, mentality of control and other things of, of trying to, I mean, I think about, here we were, and I'm thinking about the, the possibility that a governor of California could tell the church, don't sing. And I thought, you know, granted, it's all cloaked in, you know, spittle and, you know, how far droplets go. And, but I thought, you don't tell us what to do. I mean, granted, we should be wise. And, you know, if you're not with your group, make, keep your distance. Don't, don't test God, right? I'm just going to walk in there. And we were talking about that. There's a fine line between faith and presumption. That, hey, I'm a Christian. I can go do what I want. And if those people have it, I'm going to go stand next to them. You know, don't be dumb. That's just God. You're t- telling God. You're inviting God. Where Jesus says, don't test the Lord. You know, when, when Satan tempted him to jump off the temple. Hey, you know, God will have to protect you. God says, use your brain. But on the other hand... You know, we, we obey God rather than men. And, but, and, and so what we see, I hope for us, that nobody in here who considers himself, whether you're a member or not, part of our body, will say, if you don't do it this way, I'm leaving. Because what we rally around is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I, when I think about my friend this week, I thought, man, here we go. You know, dead within 24 hours, but he had a rock solid faith knowing that, man, Mondo, I'm better off. Do not bring me back. And that, when we, I'll say it this way, we know and we shouldn't be surprised that the world is going to more sharply turn against Christians. It's good, you know, God will give us the grace to make it. 
And we're seeing things and we're going to see go and go. But it's interesting that what we're experiencing is some of this little bit of government intrusion is something that our brothers and sisters around the world have experienced for a long time. Especially you go to China, India, you know, you know, all the Muslim countries. And I can tell you what, that when people are having their hands cut off for their faith, they're not arguing about these secondary tertiary issues. And I picture God asking us at times going, is that what you guys need? To keep it together? Do you want to see what's real? Do I need to bring a little bit of death and persecution and martyrdom? Will that get you to, to come together as brothers and sisters? And you guys are my kids. Don't allow these other things to divide you. Now you can disagree agreeably. Because Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by what? Our love. And then oftentimes what you have on this side is people say, well, Romans 14 says that if you love your brother, you will give in to their things. And I think, I'll tell you this. Romans 14 is talking about secondary issues there. And there it was about keeping kosher. It was about eating vegetables. It was about elevating the Sabbath above others. And these, all these different gray areas. It wasn't about the gospel. And Romans 14 says, look, if your brother or sister is at risk of losing their faith over your eating of pork, then don't eat pork. If they're at risk of losing their entire faith in Jesus because you won't wear a mask, I would wear a mask for that. Certainly, wouldn't you? But the question is, are they at risk losing their faith in Jesus? Most likely not. So theologically, what we see out there is people trying to take Scripture and force it on us and tell us what to believe and what it really means. Like, you have no right for that. The world isn't going to tell us how to interpret Scripture and what it looks like to worship God and what it looks like to sing or not to sing or what love looks like. They don't believe it anyway. But what we... What we need to do, especially here in, in the book of Galatians, Paul is writing to this group and he's saying, I cannot believe that you are so quickly departing from the gospel. These, these, Paul had gone and preached the, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ alone and, the, and the, the message of the cross. And this group came in behind him and began to subvert that begin to say, really, if you want to be accepted by God, if you want to be pleased by God, then you need to add these other things. And if you don't add them, then you're not accepted by God. And that's why in Galatians 1, Paul uses this extremely strong language. It's very unique. It's very rare. If anybody comes to you with a different gospel than what I have proclaimed to you about the message of the cross, let them be cursed forever. You go, wow, Paul, that's pretty serious. Yeah, it is. And when you look at the essential of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what that means, that is what we unite over. That is what we should divide over. And that is what binds us together. And it's a beautiful thing when we come in and say, you know what, hey, I don't agree with my brother over here on this, 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 but you know what? He loves Jesus. He loves Jesus. Man, and that's, I think he's absolutely wrong here, here, and here. But he has the freedom to believe that if he wants. He has the freedom to believe in a pre-trip, post-trip, mid-trip, old earth, young earth, whatever, charismatic gifts, non-charismatic, whatever, all those other things. But man, if he departs from the gospel, I'm going to get in his face. Because at the end of the day, when, when you think about the early church, when they were barely struggling to survive, right? They were in hiding. They were disobeying the government. They, it, was, it was risky to go and be a part of a church to gather. And you see that even modern day in China. What are you willing to risk your life for? What are you willing to divide over? It's in, and for us, what we see here is we have, when things, God forbid, it would come soon... But we need to stay united and be able to agree to disagree agreeably on these other things. And that's why at the end of Romans 14, he says, Who are you to judge your brother? 
over these things and to imply that they're somehow they have the wrong motives or they're less spiritual than you. He said, let each one be fully convinced in their own mind. We're talking about non-essentials. He's not talking about the gospel. Oh, that guy, if he doesn't believe the gospel, so that's not what he's talking about. And I find it interesting that, as we know, Jesus said this even about Satan, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. So as, as believers, we cannot take the bait of the world. We need to tolerate one another. We need to love one another. Love forbears. Love suffers, right? Love is patient. It, it, it's long-suffering. That means we suffer, actually, with people that are, um, have different viewpoints than us. And there's no doubt, I, I mean, our country is, is, is heading for an interesting, the next few months, right? My, my thought, my gut, which means nothing, okay? okay. Whatever happens in November, it's going to be interesting. I have a feeling that, again, I'm not telling anybody anything politically, except if Trump happens to get in there again, I think there's going to be an even larger reaction of riots and other things and turning on anybody that would have any sort of potential association. But even if he doesn't get elected, there's going to be a whole other, uh, especially if what you see now is this shift towards control and, and other things, very anti-Christian, okay? And I read an article this week, which is, let me just say this. Hear me, if you need to listen to the recording again, hear me carefully. I was reading an article and I thought, man, Jesus said at the time of the end, if it was possible, even the elect would be deceived. The first thing that's going to fail is truth and discernment. And we have to be extremely vigilant in making sure that our noses are in God's eternal truth, right? And it's interesting the way things are going. So, for example, when I, I was reading this article, and it was an article by uh, Dr. Michael Brown. I encourage you, you know, I don't agree with everything the guy said, but this particular article, what he was talking about was the importance of the gospel. And he says, church, we need to be awake. And he, what, he's, what he's talking about was uh, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. And he said, just so, it's, so nobody is unclear... Black lives matter. All lives matter. Every black life matter. From the time they're in the womb all the way up, they're made in the image of God. Is that unclear for anybody? But the Black Lives Matter organization is completely 100% anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-family, Anti-pro, anti-marriage, look it up. And I was like, okay, this is pretty, pretty. So I went over, and he had links in there. I went to their statement of belief, and I thought, man, these, this group, and it was started by three women, three black women. Two of them call themselves queer. I was like, I really don't know what that means. So I looked it up, and I thought, oh, okay. You know, because words change. One of them's lesbian, two are queer. Because in their statement, it was very, very pro-transgender, homosexuality. And I thought, well, this is interesting. It almost seems like there's like an equal focus on black lives versus this agenda. And if, a, if, if there was a man and a woman, they're very anti-man and woman even being married. The patriarchal. You can read it for yourself. And I thought, wow, this is pretty strong language. And doing everything they can to disrupt Male and female, God's original design. And I thought, wow, this is extremely strong. Well, then, go reading this article going down, it said, these guys are Marxist. Really? So, click on that link. And there comes up this video where one of the founders, there's the three women, and, she, and the guy was interviewed. It was a minute and 25 seconds, really short. He said, hey, what? You know, people talking about your agenda, blah, blah, blah. What's your agenda? She said, well, there shouldn't be any confusion. All three of us are trained Marxists. I was like, well, that's pretty clear. 
for us as we as we delve into two things it takes a tremendous amount of effort to be discerning because and what I, it's interesting that when you look and you see unfortunately Christians sending money and I think well again I don't know anybody's heart I just think it would be really surprising to me that a person who was pro bible would send God's resources, right? Because what do we own? Nothing. To something like that that is intentionally trying to undo this. Now, should we support the, the, the um, all lives matter? Yes, of course. Again, if you're a racist, repent. There's no room for that in the kingdom of God. But we need, this is where we see society coming and we see these things coming in and discernment is lacking and we get sucked in. So here we are. You know, here Paul is coming and he's talking to these Galatians where people had come in and they're trying to undo the gospel. And let's just read here. He asks five questions, which we're going to talk about. Galatians 3.1, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, or really this word is, Oh, you illogical Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered persecution so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And what had happened is... <coughs> Paul's out there preaching it, preaching the gospel. He leaves. These people coming along and they subvert the gospel. The very gospel that, well, he, that brings to the forefront the message of the cross. So on your question number one here, believer, this is to us. Have you become illogical and forgotten the absolute importance of the cross of Jesus? And you go... What does that mean? And that's why even these songs that we're singing, what is our identity? And I, I, one of the things I heard was, if people look at you from the outside and the first thing they think of is you're a Republican or a Democrat, that's a problem. If they think of you as a NASCAR fan or a basketball fan or a runner, before they think of you as a Christian, something's lacking there. Our identity, the thing that should define us most important of everything else is, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. My kingdom is Jesus' kingdom, which I follow is not of this world. My citizenship is in heaven. Now, again, does that mean we just take our hands off and we don't fight for righteousness? And no, That's not what I'm saying. But we also don't allow it to turn and define us. And the question for us is, I've given you some things there, is these people had come in and they had convinced these Galatians, Jesus is a great start, but you need something more. Now, let me rephrase it. How many of you have ever felt, I'm using the keyword felt, unsaved? After being saved. Man, I'm not, just like the song. I don't feel loved. And what it does for us is feelings often distort. Feelings often are opposed to truth. When a feeling comes in of, of, of being abandoned by God or being unloved by God or God isn't good, those are, those are normal, natural, common feelings. But they also can be lies. When we come to that place, what Paul is saying to them is, let me rephrase it. Galatians, do you think for one moment that your status, your standing before God can be interrupted by your actions? There's a lot of false converts, right? Uh, there's a lot of people that claim to be saved. Their profession, yeah, I believe, I believe. Jesus said, yeah, I know you. That you're, on that day, you're going to say to me, Lord, Lord, you know what? You aren't going to make it because you have deceived yourself. 
Let's remove those out for a moment, okay? Just for the sake of the... If God comes down and saves you from God's perspective, by faith, what Paul is going to ask is, did you get saved by how good you were? Or were you saved by faith in Jesus Christ and his, his death on the cross? If that's the case, Galatians, what in the world are you thinking that you could either add something by your actions, you could add something to your salvation, or by actions by your actions would take something away? Now, we might feel unsaved. And God says, you need to replace that with truth. If, if you have repented of your sins and you have truly put your faith and trust in Jesus, you have crossed from death into life. There's no condemnation. And this is why, you know, you, when you think about the importance of the gospel, especially in evangelism, D. James Kennedy years ago, he's gone now, but he came up with this really easy, as you're out evangelizing, you ask the person two questions. If you went out and you were killed in a car accident on your way home, are you 100% sure you're going to be in heaven? Well, that some people would say, absolutely, man, yep, I'm there. But they might be deceived, right? Who knows? We, that's a good question. It's good to get you thinking. But the second question is the better question. Is I was thinking about this with my buddy who died this week. He immediately went into God's presence. Hebrews 9.27 says, "Is appointed for mankind to die once. And then judgment. That leaves out reincarnation. We're not in this cycle. We die once, and then immediately we're there. And what D. James Kennedy said is, if God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? And it's what it re your answer reveals in what you trust in. Well, I went to church. I gave to the poor. I tried to be nice. I tried to be a good person. I never murdered anybody. Never killed anybody. You know, Lord, I really wasn't as bad as that guy. What we do is we whip out our resume. And that's, let's be honest, that is a human thing to do. Lord, let me tell you, why should I, you let me, let me tell you why. I tried my best. I did A, B, C, and D. God says, wrong answer. Because the next question, if he was to ask, he'd say, are you perfect? No. Perfection's required to get in this gate, buddy. Come on, Lord, that's ridiculous. Nobody is qualified. He says, yes, you're, that, now you're understanding. When we get there, we go, Lord, you shouldn't let me into heaven. I'll tell you that right now. Absolutely not. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've offended you. I know I've, I'm definitely not perfect. I've done at least one thing wrong that has offended you of being holy and perfect and righteous. You should not let me into heaven. That's the bad news. But the good news is, you said, if I put my faith and trust in Jesus who died for me on the cross to pay for all those sins that were bad, that you'd let me in heaven. He says, come right in. God's not going to ask you if you're a young earth or an old earth guy, whether you're a Calvinist or Arminian. Did you speak in tongues? He's not going to ask those questions. And that's why Paul is so furious here. Because the Judaizers were coming in and saying, when you stand before God, he's going to ask you, did you follow the law? And Paul says, oh, he's getting fired up. He puts a curse on these guys. Question two, believer, did you receive the Holy Spirit by faith or works? He asked that question. This only, and Paul's a master arguer. In verse 2, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
When you first came to salvation, and there was these miracles that were done, he mentions that in verse 5. When you came to salvation, the gospel that I preached to you, and it was evident that you received the Holy Spirit, received the glory of having your sins forgiven, did God say, I think I put it on here, number two, did God wait until you made yourself better before accepting you? Now what we do know, see this is, takes precision, okay? To be saved is to come in and go, on, I'm a sinner, Lord, I want to continue in my sinful lifestyle, but yes, I want to believe in Jesus. We don't just add Jesus and get a get out of jail free card to be like, woohoo, this is great. Forgiveness, I get to go continue in my sin, that's awesome. That is it, it denies everything that it means to to recognize that we're sinners in need of that old life being dead and we're going in the newness of honoring God. That's why Jesus, the disciples, all of them, the first word in their preaching the gospel was what? Repent. And if you come to somebody and they say, well, I want to believe in Jesus, but I'm unwilling to turn from my sin, we go, well, sorry, you're out of luck. It's not that turning from our sin earns it. How many people do we know, I, I have known many, that they'll go, well, I want to get my life straightened out first. And so that, that's positive, right? I mean, in itself, that they recognize that they're not, live, they're not living up to some standard and they want to kind of get their life right. They want to repent a little bit or they're, they're going to work on it. And then when they feel that they come to a certain place in their own standard, they're going to say, okay, I'm ready for you now. So let's say that they do. They start on this path of getting better. And then six months go by and they haven't quite received Jesus yet. If they died in, that mo in, the, in there, would they be saved? Hmm. But yet, if we come to the place of somebody saying, yes, I want to believe, and you go six months and their life hasn't changed, are they saved? Well, James would tell us faith without works is what? Dead. So we have this precision here that we have to, we know that works aren't required. Faith only. But yet faith will always do something. True faith will produce right perfection. We know that's not the case. Welcome to Christianity, right? The road is difficult. The road is narrow. He says to them, when you received the Spirit, was that by faith or works? Did you earn the Spirit? Guys, if you didn't earn it the first time, then you think that as you live the Christian life, that you're going to gain God's acceptance by, your, by trying to, to obey yourself into God's favor? I had a guy call me yesterday, and, and this takes a lot of precision, I'm telling you. A guy I knew in, in Illinois, and he says, Mondo, he just got divorced, this whole messy situation. I mean, wife has got pregnant by some other guy, and you know, that's how bad it was. So he came and he calls me and he says, Mondo, I, I, I'm struggling. I said, okay. He goes, man, everything seems to be going against me. And I just want God's favor. And I said, okay. I said, well, what makes you think that you don't have God's favor? And he goes, well, things don't seem to be going my way. And, and he said, well, and I haven't been very obedient. And I said, look, I want you to hear me carefully. And I said, and this is just random, all right? I said, uh, let's think about it in terms of numbers. That's the way my mind works. I said, you, you have come to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Absolutely, he's my savior. I, I know it and I'm, I'm, I'm repentant and I know that I need a savior. And I said, okay, I trust God for my salvation. If I died, I know Jesus is the only way. I said, okay, great. I said, by that profession, by your own testimony, it's like we baptize people. Because you made this profession, we baptize you, right? I said, you automatically have God's favor. You've been accepted into his family. Okay? Now, let, here's the question I asked him. This, 
the new guy, right? The father of the, the child now, that of his ex-wife now. I said, if you were driving down the road and you saw him pulled over or broken down, would you help him? He said, something else, no, okay? And I go, see, that's a problem. Now I understand, no one's faulting you for your emotions. I said, but there's an interesting, we know from Romans 12 that we are to overcome evil with good, right? We're to repay no one evil for evil, right? All these things. We are to heap coals of fire and we're to love our what? Enemies. I said, that's hard. Now, so let me, let me say this, going back to numbers. I said, right now, let's say you're at 30% of God's guaranteed favor. You're, can we, by obedience, will God bless further obedience in the Christian life? Yes. That doesn't earn our salvation. But if, we, if you show up late to work, you talk behind people's back, do Christians do that? Yeah. Of course. Is that going to cause trouble? Are they outside of God's favor as being one of his kids? No, you have God's favor. But what we do know is obedience. Jesus said, those who obey the will of my father will be blessed. There's something about obeying, being a good employee because you're obeying God first and coming. So what I told him is, hey, look, you're causing yourself trouble by giving into your feelings of anger and, and lack of love. I said, God, what God wants is to see you. You're his kid. You've already been there. But the choices we make don't earn us salvation, but they can. God can say, man, I'm proud of my son. Man, he pulled over and loved his enemy. Even the guy that impregnated his wife. That would be extremely difficult. But can you imagine God looking at, and I, well, what I said to him was, I said, look, I know you're not Jesus and I'm not Jesus, but we're to be like him. And when Jesus was on the cross, as they were spitting at him, mocking him, putting him in, he said, Father, what? Forgive them. Now, that's the standard. I said, look, brother, every day God's going to bless you with opportunities to love your enemy. He's going to bless you with opportunities to love. Jesus said, what did he say in Matthew 5? Blessed are you when people persecute you or insult you for my sake. Great is your reward in heaven. Now, if we don't do that, will our reward be great? No. We'll get heaven. What I'm saying is, once post-salvation, there is something to say about taking abuse, relatively speaking, for the gospel. Jesus said, man, great is your reward. When you do this, if you do it, you're, you're just building up. You're tre building up your treasures in heaven. That's true. That doesn't add anything to the gospel. That's where it takes a little bit of precision here to say, no, we're not perfected by works. Are you, the question three, believer, are you going to be sanctified by the flesh? The war is always between the flesh and the spirit. Question four, he asks, have you suffered so many things in vain? And he says this, why compromise now after suffering so much for your faith? Galatians. When you accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, by grace alone, by Jesus alone, and you were punished and you were persecuted for it, these guys come along and they trick you and all of a sudden you're willing to... It's like, well, what did you suffer for? That's why in Galatians chapter 1, he says, when he's preaching against this false gospel, he says, am I looking to please men? Because when you look at mankind, there's something about us that we have this phrase, maybe, maybe you have said it, I don't want any charity. You ever thought that? What's the root? Pride. Pride. There's something about humanity that says, hey, I appreciate God getting me started, but I want to pull myself up by my own because I want to go on the other side and say, look at me. I want to boast, not a lot, maybe a little, in my own accomplishment. The gospel of Jesus Christ leaves room for no boasting at all except in Jesus himself. That's why when we stand before him, he says, why should you live? Man, you shouldn't, Lord. Actually, let me give you all my false resume. Or let me give my resume with all my bad deeds. He says, take these. I already know. Okay. 
we go, mm -mm. I got nothing to offer except faith. I trust you. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? We know that. This last question, does God give you the spirit or answer your prayers because you have earned it through the law or by demonstrating faith? Again, there's a balance here. If I'm going out and I'm sinning deliberately, even as a Christian, I mean, we should be, be holy for I am as holy, right? That's, that's where we're, we're going. But we're, we're growing, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, from glory to glory to glory. We're, we don't arrive all quickly. God sometimes will takes a long time to sanctify us, and we're all still growing. But the fact of the matter is, if, if I go out and I sin intentionally, that's going to cause trouble. God's, and oftentimes, what, what happens is we, we do stupid things, and then we get mad at God for not rescuing us. God says, hey, look, you're the idiot in love that chose this over and over and over again. I love you, but why are you blaming me? I'm just allowing you uh, the fruit of your own consequences, and maybe there's a little bit of discipline in there. And there's no doubt if we're sinning deliberately and yet we're praying over here, there is a risk. I'll give you a perfect example. 1 Peter 3.8. It's talking about husbands loving their wives. And he's pretty solid on the husbands loving their wives. And he says, hey, Paul, uh, Peter's saying this, if you don't love your wife well, you have the risk of having your prayers hindered. God's going to go, no, I'm not going to answer your prayer here because you're treating your wife like garbage. So there is a certain sense that that doesn't mean the guy's unsaved. But God says, yeah, you have, there's the possibility of your prayers being hindered by your actions. That's where, again, it takes, it takes precision here because we want to recognize that what the argument of the book of Galatians is that we're saved by faith, we're justified. Nobody's justified by works of law. But then over in... James, faith without works is dead. And that's why during the, Roman, uh, the Reformation period, you had these people, even Martin Luther made the, the thought that the book of James shouldn't be in the Bible because its focus was so much on the works. But later it all came to be, he said, okay, well, we know we're saved by faith, but that faith is never alone. Two last things here. 1 John 3.20, this is such a great verse. If our conscience condemns us, God is greater than our conscience and knows all things. When we have those moments of discouragement or doubt, Paul would say, how did you get saved in the first place? Hmm? As, a, as a disciple... That's what you're talking about. Is remember that you were saved by faith and grace. And yes, there are expectations of what that looks like. Again, being a disciple is, is taking up your cross daily, denying yourself, right? That's, 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 the, that's the path of discipleship. If you want to be a Christian, you want to have an easy life, don't sign up. Don't sign up. You're only deceiving yourself. And this is why it's amazing to me. Think about it, in, in, whether it's in China, modern or ancient times. Hey, who wants to follow Jesus? You could be in the lion's den next week. I want to. There was something alluring about having your eternal salvation secure, knowing that your, what does our life consist of? You know, life in this life, you know, or, you know, I'm in existence of. People were willing to go into the Colosseum for their faith. What we do know depends on your theological position. That's where it's going. Believers will worldwide in the tribulation period will be martyred. In fact, it talks about them being beheaded. You go, "Ah, oh. I'll tell you what, that sifts out the true and the non-true very quickly." I don't worry about it. Because I certainly, what I mean is, if I'm there on that day, God's grace is sufficient and He'll give me grace for that day. 
But God's not going to be the grace for being martyred today because that's not before me. So I don't need to worry about it. But when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart because Paul is saying, hey, we're all going to have ups and downs. But you didn't earn it. You didn't, you didn't, do, you didn't obey enough to earn it and you didn't disobey enough to lose it. Philippians 1.6, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. I just go, oh, that's such a great verse. I'm caught. Paul says, I'm confident of this very thing. God began it. He's going to finish it. And that's why in this application here, salvation does involve you. But didn't it begin with you? You're not that great. God chose us, Ephesians 1, 4, before the foundation of the world. And I think Jesus mentioned in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me, I'm going to raise him up at the last day. And I just go, oh, I'm so glad that God, in later in John 10, God holds me in his hand. Jesus says, not only are you in my hand, no one can pluck you out. You're in my Father's hand. That's all you really need. And as we, as we, as we think about the, the glories of the gospel, Romans 8, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. And what Paul is doing here is he's reminding these Galatians, do not allow yourself to get distracted by these other things or these other viewpoints that the... the what we're going to see more and more, again, I'm not saying it's next week or even in November, but what we do know is that the gospel is going to continue to be central, and it should be. And these other things, are we have to let them fade away. Not that they're not important, we shouldn't do things, but what we do say is, man, at the end, hey, I don't care whether you wear a mask or a preacher, but just can you stick with me because we're both going down. And we both are believers in Jesus, and we both might get persecuted and martyred together. But man, we're rallying around the one who holds life in his very hands. And that's why Revelation 2.10, the promise that he gives the church, that this is the church of Smyrna. And he says, hey guys, Jesus is writing to them during the first century. You're gonna, you're gonna, the devil's going to cause you tribulation for 10 days. Many of you are going to be thrown into prison. Here's my encouragement for you. Be faithful all the way to death. And I'll give you the crown of life. How many of you would find that encouraging? You're more spiritual than me. I'd be like, what? That means I'm not getting out? Like what Jesus said to John the Baptist? Not getting out, buddy. Be faithful unto death. But there is encouragement. I'm not saying there's not. My initial reaction would be, Okay, Lord, help me to not deny you that the gospel, you, the person of Jesus Christ, and what you've done on the cross, how you've died for us and, and, and allowed us forgiveness sins to, to reconcile that relationship, that's what I'm holding on to is the person of Jesus Christ, not some of these other things. If you stand, we'll pray. Father, as we come and we sing this last song, it's It's rich. It reminds us that you are the fountain of life. That you are where we go for salvation. The world is going to continually encroach on us. But yet you've told us, again, I cannot say it enough, Romans 12, 2. Your word tells us, do not be conformed to the world. We know from James and 1 John, it's consistent that if we seek to make the, the world our friend or we love the world, you become our enemy. Help us, Lord, to continue to be wise. Would you give us a tremendous Holy Spirit dose of discernment? Help us not to get caught up in some of these other things that we would love our brothers and sisters who disagree with us, that we wouldn't divide, that we wouldn't separate, we wouldn't allow the enemy to win unless the gospel itself is at risk. 
As we say often, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, that that work that you began in us, you will complete it. What, what grace that is. What compassion that is that you have given us to Jesus as a gift and he promises that he will raise us up on that last day. That is a tremendous promise. We love you, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me Mount of thy redeeming love And here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home
Thank you guys for being with us this week, and we'll see you next Sunday.